Hi, how are you? Hey, how you going? Hey, I'm, I'm Terry David Mulligan. The show is Tasting Room Radio, some 15 years on the air. Uh, you are Tim Dolan, and you are the winemaker at uh, Peter Lehman, Barossa Valley, uh, Australia. Um, welcome to the show, and nice to meet you. Um, I, I think Thanks, I thought I saw in doing my due diligence on you, a mention that you had along because all winemakers, you know, they they sleep around. They they they'll go where there's a vineyard. And, they, <laughs> and where they can learn to, to grow wine and, you know, and make great wines. Um, I saw a mention of Canada uh, in there. Did, did you spend time here? Yeah, in um, 2010, I worked at Hillebrand Winery in Niagara-on-the-Lake. Nice. Uh, for the harvest period, yeah. It was a great experience, yeah. Did you go to make cool climate uh, Chardonnay or what? Um, yes, I did. Well. It was Chardonnay, um, Riesling really tickled my fancy. Um, and I also wanted to look at, you know, cool climate red varieties like Cabernet Franc and, and Merlot and, and Pinot Noir. Just really get myself out of my comfort zone compared to the warm, dry climate of the Barossa. Um, how different was it from what you knew? Where had you come from? Had you come from Australia? Yeah, yeah, I was, I so was where, in Australia. Where were the surprises in Niagara for you? Well, I guess, um, you know, there was the, qu the quality was exceptional. That was the first thing I noticed that, you know, the, the, particularly the reasonings that I found that were astounding. Um, but what I wasn't prepared for was how cold it was going to be. And <laughs> come, come November, I was just like, I've got to get out of here. <laughs> it's too, too cold to me. And I, I hightailed it back to, um, back to the Barossa and Andrew Wigan, the chief winemaker at the time, had offered me a position um, for the 2011 vintage at Peter Lehman. So I was did, did sort you, of- uh, Did you thank him? I, <laughs> yeah, I did in more ways than one. Thanks for the job and thanks for getting me out of this cold, icy environment. Um, so yeah, it was, but it was a great experience. I, it was such a good team that I worked with at Illa Brand and, um, and the wines were fantastic. And it was such a, you know, it was out of my comfort zone, like I said. So it was it was such a different experience, and I'd love to go back um, but, one day soon. But are you not astonished when you tell those stories uh, uh, down under um, that they that they bury their vines, they have to cover them up with uh, mulch and whatever over the winter, and that they come back and they and they actually uh, revitalize themselves and they come and they make incredible wines. It's just remarkable. Oh. It is remarkable, absolutely. And, you know, it's testament to how resilient vines and vineyards can be if they're treated correctly. Um, you know, they here in the Brosser, it can get up to 40, 45 degrees. And they think most varieties say, hey, no problem, we can handle that. And then go, to go down to minus 20, minus 30 and handle those winters is quite remarkable. Did you like our reds? Did you like the Cab Francs? Did you like the Petit Verde? I did. Yeah, I, I did. I love them. Um, and, and the sparkling as well. Yes. And and did they tell you about the Okanagan, which is basically what I'm, uh, I, and of course, Vancouver Island, all of BC. Did they t talk about out west? They did a lot. Yeah. And I've, I have visited, I've driven through Kelowna on a bit of a road trip after a friend's wedding, uh, but I haven't spent enough time visiting the wineries on, on the west coast so that's that's the next mission well, I'd love to well you may not want to move again but it would be great to have you here um <laughs> uh what do we what the, the the wine fan they they know the name peter lehman they they know it it's a brand it's brand, branding as you know is everything um was there one particular vintage that the label made its name on or is it a uh, a the years experience the many many years of one year after another coming in with great uh, releases um i think it's it was probably there's probably two significant moments in the in the lifetime of the, the company that really stood out that i think really stand out for me and the first one was obviously when the company was founded its inception in 1978 79 uh, when peter lehman was 
was sort of going through some very tough times um, with an oversupply in the industry um, and the company that owned um, the, com the company that he was working for, Saltram, um, the company that owned Saltram decided that they didn't want to take any, any grapes for the following vintage. Um, and Peter Lehman said, well, I can't really do that. I've been working with this company for 20 plus years, these growers, this is their livelihood. And so he decided that um, with backing from some investors that he would be able to take those grapes. He couldn't necessarily pay for them up front, but he could take the grapes, turn it into wine, and then hopefully um, in a few years time, sell that wine and, and pay back the growers and, and really get, get things going. So that was about 140 growers that really went along this journey with him. And it was, it was a gamble. Um, we all know 40 odd years on that it paid off, but there was a period of about 10 years where the company was really just trying to generate a bit of income to pay those growers. It wasn't necessarily known as producing wines that were really top class quality. And then in 1987, uh, Stonewall Shiraz ended up winning a trophy called the Jimmy Watson Memorial Trophy uh, at the Melbourne Wine Show. And that really put us on the map. Um, so that was, you know, 10 years of hard slog. Peter Lehman, the group that he had with him and the growers were really just battling their way through these really tough times. And um, then once we won that trophy, the momentum for being a premium quality producing consistent winery um, sort of started to gain pace. So those two things, I think for me, yeah, they're, they're the main ones that stand out. I've lost you. Sorry. Okay, I uh, I had turned my uh, my uh, microphone down so I could uh, hear a little bit more of you and the, the speakers. Um, I made a note here. Uh, we have two wines to talk about. Let, let's talk about the Chardonnay to begin with. Um, but some of my notes just I, I want to make sure that they're up to speed. Uh, some eight hundred vineyard uh, vineyards uh, hand tended. That's a lot of vineyards. Yeah. Um, what was the growing season like for uh, this Chardonnay 2020, 2021? 2021, I think if you talk to any winemaker or vineyard wine grower in Australia, they will talk about it like it's the greatest vintage they've ever had in their, in their lives. And for me and for the team at Peter Lehman, it's exactly the same. It's just like all the stars aligned. We'd been through 2018, 19, 20 where we'd seen frost we'd seen heat wave we'd seen droughts um 2021 came along and it was just great yields great quality um we could put no foot wrong and and certainly with chardonnay uh, that was no exception wow uh you can't expect that to happen every time of course uh, you're talking about uh, heat domes 40 degrees and and we we're having we're having a, an interesting spring summer here uh, in that it's wet and cooler. But as it turns out, our, the pattern has been that come June, July, it's all sun, big heat all the way through to September, if you're lucky, or October. Um, but you, there's no guarantees anymore. What's, well, how are you feeling about uh, what you're currently growing in now, the conditions and what's coming? Well, I guess, you know, the, the 2021 and, and, Certainly 2022, we, we were experiencing a La Nina um, sort of weather pattern. So much cooler yeah. conditions throughout the growing season, uh, more average rainfall. Um, spring was a little bit wetter, so we're not getting spring frost. Sure. It, all signs point to that we're probably going to swing back to an El Nino weather pattern, which means we're going to go back to those hot, dry, more typical conditions. and. So everyone's on their toes a little bit. They're not, they're not, you know, so far for 2022, we've had a very wet um, autumn into winter. Um, so, you know, time will tell, but a, a lot of us are a little bit hesitant thinking, hey, we're gonna go back to these extreme heat and dry conditions. Tim Dolan is here talking about the, he's a winemaker and he's talking about uh, Peter Lehman wines, a Chardonnay and a Shiraz. Um, when the first families came through a couple of years ago, um, all they were talking about was the uh, 
uh, Australian Chardonnay's reputation around the world and how it, it had been overtaken by other countries. Um, uh, the Vaz, you guys know how to sell your wines, but the wines were seem to be, have been stuck in a sort of a, an oak vacuum. Um, and you have a big oak program in terms of your Chardonnay, but you're very particular what you're doing. Take us through that, if you will. Yeah, so we, I mean, we, Chardonnay is a great thing because it's so versatile. And, you know, I don't think there's any, there's, there's people that are making it completely sans oak. There's people that are making it 100% new French oak with maybe a bit of American oak in there as well. I mean, we, for us, it's still an experiment. We're still playing around. So for this wine, the 2021, it's um, 16% new French oak, 29% older French and a little bit of American oak. And then the balance, which is about 55%, is tank fermented. But the most important thing, I think, is that we're spending you know, up to nine months on lees with regular batonage. I don't want to smash the wines. I don't want to you know, be working them so much so that they become overblown. I just want to, you know, probably once a month, just give them a little stir, make sure the salt is good, um, you know, keep them in good condition because it is Barossa, you know, it's, it's a warm climate and I think you need to be respectful of that and not, not make it, you know, too much. It's got to be, have that, a little bit of restraint. Uh, a little pullback. Um, uh, the, the blending of those two elements, the uh, oak infused and the stainless steel is of course the, the key. What, what, when do you know when you get there? Where is there? Oh, that, and I, I mean. I, I asked that question, Tim, because some people say, I want that same wine that I had last year. I want it exactly the same dish. Well, it's not gonna, you're not gonna get it. The land, the earth, the terroir doesn't give it to you, but no. you as the winemaker can actually find a sweet spot. Oh, it's oh, this wine out of probably all of the wines that we make at Peter Lamb, which is a lot, is the one I'd be tasting the most because if you're making a Riesling or a Semillon, it's fermented in tank and you're, you're in, in, on a, in a race to get it into bottle. That's it. You don't think about it. It's about retaining that freshness. With the Chardonnay, I'm tasting it probably at least once a month, if not once a fortnight, if I'm at the winery and not traveling. Um, to make sure that the development is going the way that you want. And the great thing, I think you've got to have a lot of tools in the belt. You've got to have, you know, a lot of things to draw from in terms of um, parcels in new oak, parcels in older oak, parcels in tank. And then you're basically putting it all together. But as you say, you're not going to get the same consistency year in, year out, because you are battling with mother nature. And that is the art of winemaking, right? <laughs> <laughs> that is an art right now one thing um it's straw colored it's beautiful it's go gorgeous in the glass except it's a green bottle why i i know it's tradition but i just kind of wonder why it's still there and why not is there a is there an offering do they once a year do they talk about maybe doing a clear bottle um i think it was probably we do another Chardonnay from the Eden Valley, which is in, in a similar um, shape and colour bottle. So I think it's probably just that consistency. Okay. I, I certainly wouldn't be adverse to, to a clear bottle, um, but it also probably is in keeping with the rest of the Barossa range, which is sort of a bit more of that, that darker um, antique green in colour. Uh, and you can't miss the nose, Tim. Uh, wonderful ripe fruit in there, a citrus. Um, uh, I saw the note go by about nutmeg. I, I I missed the vanilla, but I, I got the nutmeg because that that's on my that's on my espresso every morning. Um, <laughs> it's a beautiful Chardonnay, and 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 proudly uh, from the Barossa Valley. Is this um, is this all floor floor growings? All valley floor. Yeah, all valley yes. Floor. Are you yep. starting to work your way up into uh, altitude to to get away from the from the heat? We are. Um, typically, you know, most of the, the top quality Chardonnay is coming from Eden Valley, which has, has much higher elevation and um, the sort of soil was a, a bit more better suited to, to Chardonnay. But the thing that we focus on with Valley 4 Chardonnay is looking at certain 
clones. So the Bernard clone um, makes its way into this blend, uh, quite a significant portion. So you're looking at a little bit more of that hen and chicken, quite low yielding, um, and the, you get great acid retention, uh, which is very important in the Barossa, as we talked about being quite warm and dry. Um, it's about holding that acidity. Uh, did they tell you your price point in Canada? They did. Um, I have it on my <laughs> computer here. Uh, just for reference, I, the Brosson Shiraz is twenty one ninety nine. I don't have the, the Chardonnay. I believe it's about that nineteen ninety nine. That's yeah. fantastic. You made enough yeah. for everyone. Well, the good thing for you is that it's exclusive in Canada. So <laughs> it's it's genuinely not being sold anywhere else in the world at the moment. Um, uh, we've tapped out at about 4,000 dozen, so we've, we've made a little bit more out of 2022 on the hope that we'll get some listings in, in the UK and possibly Europe and, and then look domestically. But for the, for the first um, vintage of this wine, it's actually exclusive throughout Canada. Are we a testing ground or, or did we ask for this? How did that work? You you um you asked for it, so it's basically um off the back of demand, and I I was more than happy to help out because uh you know it's been a passion project of mine. Actually, there's another winery I think in uh, uh, Sonoma, uh, Beringer. They do they also do a a Chardonnay specifically for Canada. It's weird. That's that's a great connection. I love it. Listen, we're going to take a quick break here because uh, we're going to come back and talk about the Shiraz. He's Tim Dolan. He is the winemaker at Peter Lehman uh, Barossa, and this is Tasting Room Radio. I'm Terry David Mulligan. Uh, if you know your wines at all, even if you're a casual wine fan, you will know the name Peter Lehman Barossa, the Barossa and Shiraz. Uh, you will know the label. You will know even the cap, for God's sake. It's, it's, a, it's a very distinctive label and a very distinctive um, wine. It is unique unto itself, which is, a, as you well know, having, you know, traveled the way you have, to actually have a wine, a Shiraz, for example, from Australia, from anywhere, but Australia in particular, that is distinctive, is, a, is just a godsend. You're not like everyone else. You're one of a kind. How did this come about? So the first vintage of the Bross and Shiraz was 2015. And this was just after um, John Casella of Yellowtail fame, um, the managing director had, had just purchased Peter Lehman at the end of 2014. So he was keen to make his mark on, on the company and, and he was very quick to trademark the name The Barossan, which I think, you know, typifies exactly what Peter Lehman was all about. You know, he was sixth generation Barossan. He'd been making wine in the Barossa for, what, 40 odd years. Um, he's, he's known as the saviour of the Barossa. He's put the Barossa and Australian wine on the map globally. Um, so all things sort of led to this wine uh, in the Barossa. And we, we launched in 2015 with Shiraz. And the idea behind it was that it would be, I think, an iron fist wrapped in a velvet glove so that you get all the power that we know Barossa Shiraz delivers, but you get a beautiful, soft, elegant finish. It's not going to blow your socks off. It's not 16% alcohol. That's not the way we wanted to go. It was about drinkability. Sure. Um, and I think that's the main focus for this wine is freshness, drinkability, and approachability. And good barrel work. Is it lots lot of, of barrel work? A lot of new barrel? About 25% yeah. new American oil. And then the balance into older oak, so all all um, aged in, in three hundred liter hogshead. And how was the uh, the uh, growing season for this uh, this uh, twenty nineteen Shiraz? Twenty nineteen uh, is regarded as a very good quality vintage. It was it was quite hot, quite dry, so the yields were, were way down on average. But you got uh, but some what you, got, you got some rain along the way, did you not? There was a little bit of rain, um, so that that kind of helped things. We, we often see a, a little bit of rain in summer into, into early autumn, and that usually freshens things up. That's quite regular. You don't want too much rain, obviously, at that point, so everyone's sort of on, on tender hooks. But um, the thing was that, that that sort of cools things down a little bit, it allows the grapes to freshen up. 
and the quality out of 2019, particularly for reds and Shiraz, is exceptional. Um, so this wine, you know, I don't, I don't typically say, you know, age this wine for a long period of time, but 2019 with the quality that it is, I'd probably go at least five to eight years for this wine. Five to eight? Yep. Okay. Any longer? If you want, I mean, for me personally, I I would drink it in more in its youth when it's still fresh. But if you if you're liking those sort of age characters, I'd go up to ten years. Um, I I noticed there was a mention of uh, 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 food pairing with it because we're in a bar barbecue season now, and and uh, it was <laughs> recommended uh, I think a beef burger. I didn't understand some of the uh, Australian terminology for the side plate stuff that was supposed to be around. I think crackers were involved. Um, <laughs> but you know how we here eat in Canada. It's mac and cheese, it's burgers, it's salmon, it's uh, um, steak. Uh, it, it has its place. I mean, it's a Shiraz for Pete's sake. It travels well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of my favorite foods you know, when, when I like to spoil myself is, is get a scotch fillet and put it on the barbecue, medium rare, um, and, and just keep it really simple with some roast vegetables. I think, you know, you can't really go wrong. Um, so that, that's my go-to. I miss your hiccup when you mentioned the food. What, what did you want to put on the barbecue? Oh, sorry, just a, a scotch fillet. Oh, yes. Which... Um... It might this might be a little heavy for salmon, but I mean, if you're if you're crusting it and barbecuing it and giving it some smoke, why not? Why not? We're going into barbecue yeah. season uh, and with salmon season as well. Just the water's right there. Um, uh, this is not exclusive to Canada. This is a worldwide wine, is it not? Yeah, it's it's available globally. Uh, you can pretty much find it everywhere and quite predominantly in the, on the domestic market. I was saying that it is, it's, I, I actually talked to myself when I first tasted it and I thought, I understand this now. I understand. I, I, me I remember talking to Peter a long time ago. Um, I understand why it's so successful again, because it's distinctive. It's singular. And there are thousands of wines in the world. If you can become a singular wine, you have absolutely hit the jackpot and you have it's fantastic is it is it difficult in the blend does it is it is it a painstaking process we're, well it's funny you say that because we're actually blending this the 2022 of this wine uh, this morning so after i jump off this this interview well, i'll be going straight into the tasting lab and it's going to take about a day to put all the components together and then from there it's back in the barrel for 14, 15 months. So Tim, what's the democracy in that day? Who actually makes that final call? There's four winemakers and it's completely democratic. So we all have a 25% say. Um, as you can imagine, the debate can get heated. Most of us are, are pretty diplomatic, but sometimes the foot gets put down. <laughs> um, you know, we, we quite quite strong in our opinions from time to time. So yeah, it can, it can take a while, but this is a big blend. So there's a lot of components going. And the, ne the next one coming up is even better. I would assume they all just get better and better. Now, is there anything coming that you want to tell us about? You want to tease us, tease us about? So I think, um, you know, we're going to be pretty strong with the Bross and Chardonnay. So that's, that's the next phase is to, continue the growth of Barossa and Chardonnay, particularly throughout Canada. Yeah. Um, we've got a, a portrait Shiraz, which is probably in Canada, three or $4 cheaper than the Barossa and Shiraz that we're gonna look to relaunch. Um, we've got some new packaging for that wine and that's sort of quintessential classic Peter Lehman, um, a little bit less oak, um, slightly fresher. Um, and then we've also, the long time players, which is Layers White and Layers Red, um, which have been around throughout Canada since um, I think about 2008, 2009. Yeah. They're looking to be extended um, along with the Barossa range, so throughout Canada. So look, looking at sort of a bit more of a play with the distribution footprint, 
Um, but supply chain issues make things pretty challenging at this time. So, um, you know, everyone's trying their best, but it's going to be a challenge for the next 12 months at least. Did you go to see any hockey games while you were here? No, I didn't. And I was in Canada in 2004 when after, after I'd done a vintage in um, uh, uh, Sonoma, I came up to Canada, strike was on, managed to go to a, a local game, um, but I missed out on the NHL, <laughs> so I was devastated. <laughs> what is the um, price point on the Peter Lehman Barroso, the Barroso and Shiraz 2019? 2099. I'm sorry, you, you must you, you must be wrong. You said 2099? Yep. How is that possible? <laughs> How is that possible? That's what we're all about here, Terry. It's value I'm for money. Kidding. Okay. I'm I am truly impressed because I get asked every day of every week, what well, uh, where can I find a great wine that doesn't come and bang me over the head? I've just found two of them. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Uh, listen, how, how, go and do your blending and your, your all that stuff and have yourself a great growing year. And please come back. Um, when you come back, tell when they ask you to go back to Canada, say, I'd like to go to the Okanagan and stay for a couple of weeks and taste the Syrah and Shiraz up and down there and the Petit Verdot over there and the uh, 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 Dolcetta over there. And uh and all of that stuff, and, and the Tempranillo, and that Zinfandel that's over there, and and we'll uh, we'll pour it for you. I mean, it's just such a beautiful part of the world, particularly the West Coast. I would love to come back and particularly get stuck into your wines because I think they've come a long way. Thank you for your time, Tim, and thank you for your art. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. It's been great chatting.